Hello, hello, and welcome to Alta Live. This is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. I hope that everyone is safe and indoors from the storms that are ravaging much of the West Coast right now. Um, I am so excited to welcome all of you here today for a conversation with Ken Lane. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction of, of Ken Lane. Ken publishes Desert Oracle and hosts its companion radio show and podcast from a haunted old compound in the great Mojave wilderness, one of four American deserts Ken has called home. You can read his incredible article, his, his kind of first person story, an ode to Desert or Oracle. This is the story of how the Desert Oracle came to be um, and how it, how it may be coming back to us. Today, Ken will be in conversation with Alta's managing editor, head honcho, Blaise Zariga, the man who himself introduced me to Ken Lane and his work um, several years ago. Before I turn it over to Blaze, I'd just like to let everyone know that Alta, if you're unfamiliar with us, is an award-winning quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. You can join us for $50 a month. You get a cool hat. Um, in addition to four issues of Alta, we've got a $3 monthly subscription. We bring you the California Book Club every month. Um, weekly events like Alta Live every Wednesday. We've got a collection of newsletters, a Monday book review, a weekend read. If you like this kind of conversation and content and incredible learning more about incredible folks like Ken and Desert Oracle, I do hope you will check out Alta Journal. You can visit us at altaonline.com. This conversation will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. There's a Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen beneath Blaze and Ken. If you've got any questions for Ken, please use that box to ask them. The chat is open. I love to see where everyone is zooming in from. So as we get started, um, I'm here in Nevado, California in Northern Marin. Um, and with that, I welcome you all and turn it over to, to Blaze and Ken. All right, thank you, Beth. Hello, thank you, Beth. And hello, Ken, again. Ken, Ken Hi, is, uh, he has the honor of being our first Boomerang guest on All to Live. Um, I think it was in 2020 when you were last on All to Live. Uh, that was upon the publication of Desert Oracle Volume 1. That's um, right. And this is a hardback, and then it went into paperback. Uh, I was just checking today. It's, it's on the um, LA Times bestseller list. A um, year still. straight. Yeah. It's incredible. The first one on last January, and it's uh, is still there. Yeah, and and it's a compendium, of not 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 complete, but of I, I'm in New York. Uh, I brought these with me. I don't you know, don't leave home without the Desert Oracle. Uh, you never know when you may need some Mojave wisdom from uh, Reverend Lane here. Um, I think this is the first one, 2015, and some more recent issues. So uh, I'd like to get started with a little bit. Uh, I, I think soon many people are familiar with Desert Oracle, but uh, for those who are not, and who have maybe not read the Ken's uh, essay in the current issue yet, uh, Ken, could you just tell us a little bit about, you know, a thumbnail description of what the Desert Oracle uh, is? Sure. Desert Oracle, especially the, the ones you were just holding up there, started in 2015 as an alleged quarterly periodical that was focused on, on the American desert, deserts in general, and in particular on the mysteries and strange stories and the sort of oddities and... Um, that the very hard to bottle feeling that you get when you are out in the middle of, of the American wilderness, uh, the desert in particular. And we have so much of it in the Southwest because so much of it is public land. Uh, a lot of it's military bases as well. But unlike say where you are today in the East Coast, yeah, you can go up to the Hudson Valley uh, you can go to the seashore, but you can't easily go to a place where you can find yourself surrounded by hundreds of square miles of absolute wilderness and yep. just stand there and, and, uh, 
and and face yourself and 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 the world. Yeah, and and I th I do think you deliver on that in your first issue. I've quoted it several times, um, but you described that your your mission was to create a reading experience that would be like nearly stepping on a rattlesnake or coming upon the tracks of a mountain lion on a solo hike in a lonesome canyon. You know that sort of um, awe and, and wonder and you know perhaps terror or beauty you know all mixed in and I, I really uh, have enjoyed being a, a subscriber um, of, of yours for some time now. And oh thank you. Yeah and, and when I reached out to you uh, about writing this essay for Alta Journal at the time you had announced on social media that you were going to have to shut uh, Desert Oracle down. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if you could you know, talk a little bit about what had changed in from, you know, in 2015 to, I guess it was probably early 2022, when it seemed, you know, that it was the pandemic, uh, what had shifted um, that led you to, to perhaps, you know, thinking that it was inevitable, uh, that the end was inevitable? Um, what has changed? Well, levels levels of desperation go up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, levels of financial insecurity, as we like to say, uh, we used to just say we're broke, but now we have to. Yeah, now we have to make it sound like it's uh, it's a, a, a national problem. Uh, I started the magazine, and it was just the magazine, and I was doing everything myself except for some freelance pieces that I was very happy to get from talented people who shared my my view, my obsession with uh, the desert, like Rachel Monroe, who's now the Texas West Texas correspondent for The New Yorker, uh, Jay Babcock, who used to do Arthur Magazine, which was a, a indie alt culture, monthly in the early 2000s that was very influential uh, especially in California and uh, Doc Daniels out of Arizona who uh, finally put out his own book about his his long weird experience with something called the Mojave phone booth which was uh, a standalone public phone in the middle of what is now Mojave National Preserve yeah it's in there yeah Doc wrote that um, but as far as the editing, the printing, uh, the distribution, I was never able to find other people, magazine, all the magazine distributors were kind of going under at the time for the indie mags. Everybody was throwing everything online. You know, thank God for things like Alta that are that are beautiful print publications because, you know, that's rare now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, lots of people would like to do it, but they threw away their audience for Facebook and uh, for for social media likes. And as the world learned, we don't get paid for that. You know, Zuckerberg gets paid for that, or he used to. Now he's destitute. He's down on Market Street. You know. Uh, eating uh, eating scraps off the ground is terrible. Now he'll be rich forever. He'll bury us all. Yep. So when it when it was just the magazine, I could do it. I was of course eight and a half years younger at the time, which starts to make a difference. Uh, and I've heard, and it was uh, uh, mostly through adrenaline and the excitement about doing a new project that I got through about two and a half, three years of putting out issues pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as some people showed up here and there and said, you know, we'll pay you to do a little something different. Like you, know, you could do a, uh, you can do some live shows. You can do some campfire stories. You can do a, a book, whatever. I would I would take those things because I was kind of worn, you know worn out, and I hope that somebody would come along and say, and I still hope. And if anyone's listening out there, uh, maybe you're a a, a a wealthy widow who always wanted to be a, a magazine publisher, 
Um, we can get married. We can move to your ranch in Montecito if it's still there. Might have been flooded out. And, <laughs> and song. yeah, you'll be a publisher. I'll be the editor. It'll be a beautiful relationship. And I'll never be there. I won't bother you. Um, that's what I would still like to happen in some way. I'd like to have some other people involved in the magazine. Is 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 how many people do you all have doing Alta? You probably have about a hundred. No, you have about twenty five, right? Not Including quite. designers. Yeah, not quite, man. Twenty two. Much smaller. We we have a. I mean, we we we're lucky in that much like you, we rely on a a really great network of regular freelance contributors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you have a lot of lot of names who show up, and your books coverage, especially, uh, like David uh, Olin. Olin, how does I don't know how to say his last name. David Olin is extraordinary. Yeah. So and and people love that about Alta. So uh, mm -hmm. it got harder and harder to find the full time to try to get out a magazine. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, all my retailers shut down for a long time. They came back, but for a while I just said, well, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to distribute it anymore. So maybe I should just end it and concentrate on books and the radio and da, da, da. But the, the, the fun is putting out a print publication. If you can get it out, that's the most fun. That's the most satisfying. It's the most satisfying to hold afterwards. Tell me, tell me why. Yeah, I mean, these are, you know, they're, they're things of beauty. Uh, and, and your Alta is also, you know, we, we put, we're print first. I mean, we really put yeah. a lot of you know, effort into the, the print publication. And we believe that it's a, you know, it's a different experience than what, Online is terrific, you know, of course, don't get me wrong, but it's just a different platform. Completely, and... it, completely. The photos in, in Alta, for instance, it's like art prints. You, know, mm -hmm. you could you could cut those out and put them in a frame. It's just beautiful printing. You don't really? get that looking at a monitor, mm -hmm. uh, no matter how many pixels it has or anything. Not least because there's things popping up constantly saying you haven't done this and you haven't done this and you have to consent and et cetera. Yeah. So it's, and it survives. Um, there are newspapers around from all over the world from a hundred years ago. And I think when we're a hundred years in the future it's gonna be much harder to find any evidence of God, I know certainly every online thing I've ever worked for has been like sued into bankruptcy and shut down and destroyed and uh, the URLs direct to some like crypto scam site or whatever. So mm -hmm. it it lasts is for posterity. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I know we, we share a lot of the same interests. Um, and for me, when I we get that those first we call them first bounds, the first issues that come off the press. Yeah, I get a small number of them before the rest of the run comes in. I, I, there's no better feeling, you know, it's one of the best feelings in the world to open that box and to feel yeah. the effort of the whole team, and, uh, you know, is put into this. It's a real so, tangible product. So. It's tangible. Yeah. Yeah. And I was always trying to make Desert Oracle look like the desert, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very stark. Um, inside is only black and white the covers are printed on colored cardstock which a lot of the old guidebooks used to do in the desert mm -hmm. so it's just black printing because there used to be regional publishers all over doing things like yeah. this yeah. Uh, and and now it's a rarity so uh so i'm gonna i'm still i have hopefully someone who's going to be coming on to help me with editing for this year and beyond i hope um, and I hope, uh, that we can get yeah, the, I mean, be I, the, the best thing about it is, is booksellers and retailers ask for it. That makes it possible because there's no distribution for little things like this. Well, we, we have found the same, Ken. We are now, you know, we realize that our people who read books are people who are going to read Alta. Yeah. And so we, we really leaning hard and, and working closely with booksellers. We, that's, actually, that's the way that's the, those are the last good consumers on earth yeah and you mentioned that you were in uh we're like benton springs somewhere in the eastern sierra this weekend 
and you uh, went to a yeah, bar. last week I was in Benton Hot Springs in the Eastern Sierra, and we hit Spellbinder, Spellbinder Books, been there for 50 plus years in Bishop, and there's a big stack of, of the Altas, which you can see from outside, they're so big. <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's an oracle nearby, yes. And there was Desert Oracle nearby. Yeah, there was a there was the, there was a paperback of Desert Oracle there, and there was a nice stack of the Alta journals right up front by all the local, state, nature, et cetera, stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was great. That was uh, I had one. You'd sent me the new issue, but I hadn't gone to the post office and got it yet. So uh, that was the first time I saw it, and it's just it's great. People are walking around like, "What's that? That looks cool." Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I, I know this is already a love fest <laughs> between me and you, but I will tell you that um, the current issue of Alta, you know, I, I feel like it, in some ways it was inspired by some of your some of your tales, in, in whether you know it's the Hermit Ballerina or the tale of the Yucca Man, yep. uh, the Alien Warriors, you know, all these great stories in, in in your publication. That when we were putting together the lineup. Uh, it led us to uh, a story that's in the current issue called The Cactus with Twelve Arms. And, and it's the, a tale, and that's told to by Clay Wurst, who's a 93-year-old uh, miner looking, still searching for the lost Dutchman gold mine in yeah. the mountains of Arizona. So, you know, that's an homage to you in some ways, Ken. Well, so thank good. you. I mean, those are great stories, and they often get ignored because they're not considered timely and topical. But the attraction to the wilderness and the desert is often that it's not timely and topical, that it mm -hmm. takes you out of time, out of the day-to-day -day stuff that worries you. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing for me that's more delightful than looking at my phone and I'm out of range. You know, it's like, thank God, because well, more and more, it's hard to find any place. And that's the beauty of the, um, you know, quarterly frequency as well. I think that you you are, so in a way, outside of the news cycle, you, yeah. you rift about news and what's happened to news, how it's become homogenized, and there's an absence of place in mm -hmm. public today. Um, and and I, I can't couldn't agree with you more on, on all that. Um, what what are some of the, you know, I guess. When the new the new issue is going to come, do you have a date yet for the new issue? Um, <clears throat> I like I, I told you in an email recently. Um, it's getting harder to print this stuff on offset presses, real offset presses. There's fewer and fewer of them, yeah. and every local newspaper used to have their own at least black and white offset press most of them have had color for 30 years yeah. at this point but they've been convinced to stop doing their own stuff to form these little uh regional newspaper groups which are then bought by bigger groups which then just shut them all down and make the papers from a central location somewhere and print them by contract in one place so that 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 has been the latest pain, mm. uh, oh. but it looks like uh, I've it look. I'm telling I'm telling subscribers now, if they believe anything I say anymore, that they're going to go out by the end of February. So it'll still be winter 2023. That's what I swore to whatever deities were nearby when I made the pledge that that would happen. So it should go out by the end of February. Um, and so people should see them by the first week of March, I hope. Yeah. And then hopefully the, the first issue where I have some editorial help will be putting together after that. And, yeah. uh, and I just carved out the time to, uh, to to delivery basically mm -hmm. because it's years ago that was one of the things that seemed so romantic about it yeah. is that you'd make your books and then you'd get in the car and you go sell them mm -hmm. and i've got all these wonderful desert bookstores all over the southwest and so that's a tax write-off right 
I'm going to go to Arches and Zion and go drink in Moab and everything else. But if I sell 50 books at Back of Beyond in Moab, well, that's a tax write-off. What, what's been your favorite issue or your favorite story um, in, in the oh, desert? Oh, God. You pretty good to ask that a lot, no? Um, I think the one that made a real impact as far as the sort of folk culture of the place, I wrote this huge thing weaving together all these little bits of legend and fact and newspaper clipping and such about the 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 monsters of the Mojave Desert. Uh, and they have many different names, but uh, Yucca Man is the one around here. And to my delight, Yucca Man has kind of become a thing. You know, people talk about it. Uh, uh, there are stickers and t-shirts, you know, at the souvenir <laughs> stores. And that's, that's kind of a, a, a badge of you've made some sort of folkloric uh, difference Fun. because n new generations of people are growing up with, with those stories, which are great stories. And they're also great reminders that weird things only happen when you have lots of open space. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, hasn't been a Bigfoot scene, you know, we had P22, but there hasn't been a Bigfoot in Griffith Park, as far as I know, uh, since it's been surrounded on all sides by suburbia and Hollywood on the other side. Mm -hmm. Do you, are there uh, Bigfoots out in, in Joshua Tree somewhere? Have you? Well, that's, that's where the Yucca Man story comes from. So it had, it was bits and pieces of it. And then there were other similar manifestations, entities, whatever they are. Uh, they share a similar sort of frightening shape and size and the, the weird burning eyes. I mean, it's, it's stories that you can find in Greek mythology. It's stories you can find in the Bible, the Mothman in Point Pleasant, West Virginia was a weird shadowy entity with kind of like wings and red eyes. And people always kind of see him. You never get too close to them, uh, but they have some of them, the Mothman especially, had this great sense of dread. You know, like you see this thing and you just want to die. So that's an experience a lot of people want. Right. What, uh, and, and in your essay you wrote, um, maybe I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. I should have given you a heads up. No, but, you can't. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so you mentioned like class, that old, you know, local newspapers used to have uh, classifieds and, you know, Lonely Hearts listings. Yes. And uh, I was thinking it would be interesting, like, to ask you, if Desert Oracle were to have classifieds, what would people want to sell or give away? I think you used the example of free goats. Um, uh, uh, let's see. I'm just glancing at the oh, chat uh, here. Because okay. that'll give us an idea. And, and then um, also, what if, you know, if, if and I've thought about this for Alta too, like, what if we had, you know, Lonely heart, Hearts listings, like what, you know, de desperately seeking what, you know, who are, who are these people that would, you know. Desperately seeking person who's never around and who spends all their time looking for a lost mine in the Panamint Mountains and will, uh, <laughs> forward their social security checks to me, you know, a dollar something word, like that. A dollar word, you'd run, you'd run that, huh? We did have early on some, some property listings because that's uh, a big part of the that. desert. Yeah, yeah people so come out and they think, oh my God, what if I could live here? And of course, in the pandemic, that's what happened to where happened. I live. Those early issues with those lists, I remember thinking like, hey, you know, maybe we could, you know, they weren't that, ex that I don't think they were that expensive, I recall. And now with, you know the prices i'm guess pandemic airbnb yeah it's not although it's 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 a good time to start looking again because the airbnb thing out here at least has certainly peaked there's lots of empties which mm. is good because people who lived here joshua tree lost 15 percent of its population between 2010 and 2020. we only had eight thousand people to start with mm -hmm. 
And because so many places that had been rentals for uh, people who lived here, people who worked here, mm-hmm. turned into vacation rentals, they left. They and, had to go and, somewhere else, you know. Uh, what, but what was it like living there during the I'll call it peak Airbnb? You know, during the pandemic when people were fleeing, you know, L.A., San Fran, wherever, going to a desert and. It's, you saw it in traffic, you saw it in the grocery store, you saw it in a couple places like that, but because it's spread out, not a lot of people want to, want to come out here and, you know, be on a 10th of an acre, like they're in uh, Berkeley or Echo Park or something. They want some space. So you tended not to see, it wasn't like there were crowds. Now, there were crowds going in and out of the National Park because suddenly Joshua Tree, which is National Park, which is sort of sat here mostly happily ignored by the 25 million people in Southern California. Is that right? It's about 25 million people. Right? Well, I, I know we have a story on Joshua Tree, how it's um, near fatal popularity. You know, how right. The, the, I saw it. And, and I, you know, it's uh, I've. I've seen that those stories have good points. Yeah. At at the same time, it's it's desert wilderness. Yeah. You know, one storm comes through and it pretty much blows any trace of of humanity down to down to the Coachella Valley. Uh, but you have too many people all the time. Yeah, it's bad for wildlife. Uh, it makes it hard to enjoy the solitude. You know, when there's not any, but in the desert is always not that difficult to not go where the crowd is. It's just our nature. We want to go, we ask the, the, the phone, how do we get to Joshua Tree? And of course, they send you to the same place. They send everybody else. Mm-hmm. But if you go 45 minutes outside of this area, you're in real wilderness where you really won't see people. You can even do dispersed camping and um, hike by yourself and see wildlife, bighorn sheep, all kinds of stuff. What, um, and, and we're almost out of time. Uh, well, I know Beth will come on with some and bring some questions from the audience. Um, and, but to g- ask again for the next issue of Desert Oracle, are there any changes, any um, things, anything you can tip your hat on? It's, well, uh, for people out there who have the last issue, which was a, a somewhat of a change in format, um, because it was all mail order, it was we didn't have shops open at the time, and I was trying to make it a little more newspapery, although still the same size. Is going to be the the issues that are coming out in twenty three are going to have the yellow covers and it's. It's, uh, uh, I, I love that style. I changed it during the pandemic just because I thought I got to do something. It seems like you got to respond. I probably shouldn't have. I probably just should have left it alone. So it, it'll it be like that again. Um, there are some, there are a lot of weird stories in there. There are some stories that started off as short radio pieces for the Desert Oracle radio show and podcast for people who aren't near our our transmitter um that i've made into longer full pieces with maps and art and references and things like that and um and and there has been a misperception i guess that it's about joshua tree desert oracle has never been about joshua tree is I need to live sort of in civilization for things like post offices and internet and whatever. So this is a compromise. I once, once I retire for good, I will be 30 miles from the nearest town, which I, you know, I can't wait for. Where will that be? Uh, that's probably going to be up in the Eastern Sierra, uh-huh. uh, um, way up North of, well, I can't tell you. There's people start coming. There. <laughs> no, exactly. I was just saying, you know, like uh, uh, a, a secure, on. undisclosed location. All right. Like well, they used to say at nine one one. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll bring, I invite um, Beth back on, please, to to lead us out. But I also want to just urge everyone to please, you know, support Desert Oracle. Go to desertoracle.com, subscribe, 
buy his book, buy Ken's book. Thank um, you, Blaze. And go mm-hmm. and go get that desert issue of Alta because it's really cool. Um, I bought one at the bookstore, so I, I still have. I picked up the mail. Thank you for sending the one. I haven't taken it out of the envelope because I've been reading the other one. Um, thanks for all the Alta. I feel like Alta needs, and I don't know how we would do this, but just like a an in person experience with Ken Lane and Desert Oracle around the campfire, like oh. campfire stories with Ken. Blaze, I, you're yeah, we should you know. we should do that. We, I feel like you just nodded approval. Fantastic. And we're doing we're doing something at Skylight. Doing aren't we are doing we are doing if for those of you that are in the Southern California area on February 27th, um Alta will be celebrating the desert issue um at Skylight Books. And Ken will be there reading from his piece um in this issue along with Susan Strait. Um I forgot who else is on the list, but we have a number of kind of exciting uh Southern California Alta contributors who will be there um, as well as Blaze. So join us for that. But first, questions. All right. Um, I realize we touched upon Bigfoot, and thank you, Ken, for taking us there. Um, of course. Matt asks, is the desert getting less weird? I don't think so. Um, because what makes, and when I say desert, I'm talking about wilderness. I'm I'm not talking about Coachella Music Festival with Big Bunny or whatever the hell his name is. Uh, it's Bad Bunny, I know. When you're old, do that to annoy young people. <laughs> Y'all, you you kids like that Big Bunny? You know? um, it means you're out in the the, the wild natural world uh, where you have to face yourself and you are you're not just a consumer of the earth you're you're part of it for at least that little bit of time so if you're in wilderness it's always what happens in wilderness uh people serial killers escape to the wilderness that's fun (laughs) right um People go crazy and they go up mountains to talk to God. They made a whole aliens, movie aliens. about that. The Ten Commandments out of the Bible. Aliens, if you believe in aliens, sure. There's always monsters. You can call them whatever you want. You can call them the angel of death. You can call them yucca man. Uh, there's all, if, if you believe as I'm, I'm mostly Celtic, Scots and Irish. Uh, so and I grew up with a, a firm belief from my spooky old grandparents that, that everything was filled with spirits. And if you want to feel that, go out to the wild desert at night and go place yourself somewhere and, and watch and listen. And if nothing else, you're going to hear wildlife. You're never going to hear at home. You're going to have owls going by and strange little critters running around you so if if it's not weird where you are drive another 20 miles and it is definitely not getting less weird i feel like to answer your question matt weird level maintained yeah rachel just, has... just avoid the crowds <laughs> yes rachel asks um how is or is climate change affecting your experience in the mojave or desert the deserts which you inhabit? um I mean, it's an extreme climate already. That's what makes it desert, is arid. Um, You have extremes of wind because you don't have the tree cover in other places. The main things that I've experienced living here in recent years is what we all have in in California, which is wildfire smoke uh, from persistent drought and uh, all of our uh, brush and stuff lighting up our, our forests. It's a little hotter than it used to be, but honestly, not noticeably to people who spend a lot of time in the desert because you go out in the desert in summer is hot. It'll kill you. So if it's one degree Celsius more, it's not going to change that uh, terrifically. I'm not. This is not a uh, discounting climate change or the the effects on the the whole world, but in the desert you're likely to notice it less, 
And if you like the desert, a little bit of harsh weather isn't going to scare you because, you know, you came here for that. You could be in San Diego if you like good weather all the time. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen a couple of mentioned of dis, mentions of dispersed camping. What is it? That's when, say like you're a family, you know, like you got a couple kids and a parent, you know, old Uncle Bill or whatever. You leave one person every, in one square mile. So like you leave a baby here and then a mile down the road, you leave like another kid. So you're dispersed. That's not, I'm sorry, I lied. I, so uh, <laughs> dispersed, dispersed camping just means you can camp in an existing sort of pull-off area um, and you're supposed to stay away from other people. So you can do that on a lot of Bureau of Land Management lands where they say you can, you know, this area, there's 100 acres of dispersed camping in this area. Just don't get right on top of other people. And do you know anything about what's happening in Nipton? Uh, oh, Nipton just got bought again by like some sex circus. And you can oh, go I heard out circus. There. I didn't hear the sex circus part. Yeah, it's like an erotic circus, apparently, that has some kind of like nightclub act in Las Vegas. Sounds like a lonely, it sounds like a classified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, it, Nipton has gone through all kinds of stuff. It was going to be like a, a, a marijuana retreat at some point. I don't know what the logic was behind that. I mean, ev everywhere in California is a marijuana retreat. Mm -hmm. um, a sex circus. So now it's going to be a sex circus, apparently. I, I hope to read about that in the Desert Oracle. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening with Desert Oracle radio and podcast and how... We can access that. Sure. Um, that. Oh, somebody just said X-rated. So it's an X-rated circus. I don't know what that means. They do they do unholy things to an elephant, I think. Um, it's not, not for kids. You got to be 12 and up. So uh, Desert Oracle Radio is on Friday nights in Joshua Tree, Yucca Valley, 29 Palms, this area on uh, KCDZ 107.7 FM in the high desert. And you can hear it in Mojave National Preserve. And I have heard from a number of people who go out to the preserve specifically to pick it up because it's very spooky that way. It's all scratchy and crackly on their car radio or their little campsite radio. The podcast uh, just whatever uh, surveillance device you carry around, just say play Desert Oracle Radio and it will record that and it'll play you the thing. And still doing the radio show. I do, I aim to do them weekly, but it's hard because there's only one of me and I have to do all these other things. So there's usually two or three a month. Um, and the, the, uh, somebody asked in here about the subscriptions, you can subscribe to the magazine at desertoracle.com. And that's got links for all the, you know, e-commerce, all that kind of stuff. Also, Beth, when you said $50 a month for Alta, it's $50 a year, isn't it? I'm sorry. Yes, it is $50 a okay. year. Subscribe to Alta is not just for the rich. $50 a year you can afford. $50 a year. And you get a hat. Oh, see, I got to start sending people like a hat. Wow, I can. I, it, it, that stuff's in the not, it's not free. Yeah, I don't even have t <laughs> You get a hat yet. and a book, I'm being reminded. You get oh, a CBC yeah, you get a book. hat and a book. And uh, and you, you can come out and spend spend a couple of weeks with me cleaning up the property. Um, last question for you. Christy asks, what are the night skies like in the desert? Oh, they're fantastic. Um, even in, even in this area, which is pretty close to Los Angeles. Um, oh, we're, we're, what happened to the, are we still on? We're I think still she on. Went to I, I went, I went dark to cough. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Um, night skies are, are, are very good out here. You can see the Milky Way on a moonless night. Again, if you drive an hour east, northeast 
of Joshua Tree and and the weekend crowds and the lights on the highway, like from our our lovely local businesses such as Home Depot and Walmart, which you you know fill fill the the immediate sky with their terrible Klieg lights. You will see even more stuff. And um, we do have a dark sky thing going on with the National Park and uh, uh, and with the National Dark Sky Alliance. So uh, from a campground, it's best. Don't like rent a vacation rental on the highway, on Highway 62. If you're coming out specifically to see stars and planets. Oh, somebody said, please repeat the date of the Skylight event. I don't it's, know when it is. Well, let me tell everyone. I haven't posted on the website yet. I will get to that this week. I promise. It is Monday, February 27th at Skylight Books, um, starting at 7 p.m. Open to the public. Please join us. Um, and I'll get that posted. For those of you in the Bay Area, I'd like to invite you. Ken won't be there, but Blaze and I will be at Bookshop West Portal, where we will also be celebrating the desert issue. That's on January 20th, Friday, January 20th, um, a week from Friday. Bookshop West Portal in San Francisco. We will have um, reading from uh, the issues, poet James Cagney and writer Marcus Crowder, as well as online Alta, um, online contributor Mary Ladd. So I hope you'll join us for that. We'll raise a glass to the issue, to Ken um, and to Alta. Um, and of course, please join us in LA. Before I let Ken and Blaze and all of you go, I would like to invite you next week. Um, if you were, were welcoming Illustrator Joe Chiardiello. I think that's we're gonna. I'm gonna find out exactly how to pronounce his name. But he is the incredible illustrator oh, that yeah. contributed artwork to. And Ken. Where's the one with the big horn and the UFO? I, if you believe yeah. in aliens, says Ken Lane here, right here. Oh, that's wild. Um. So the artist Joe Chiardiello will join us next week. He's a prolific magazine illustrator and will discuss his process with us, um, show us some of his work, some of his process in terms of putting this article together. So if, so hopefully if you're a fan of, of Ken's work in Alta and of course Desert Oracle, I think you'll be really interested in, in next week's event. That is a week from today, Wednesday, January 18th at 12.30 p.m. With that, I'm so grateful to our audience to my wonderful boss, Blaze, and Ken Lane. Thank you so much for joining us um, and all to live once again. You're welcome. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Blaze. I'll, I'll see you all next yeah, month. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. It's been so much fun. I'll see you in Joshua Tree. Thanks. Bye. Take care, all. Bye.